Good evening, and thank you for joining us. My name is Mariela Colon, and I'm with the Adult Services Department at the Chicago Public Library. Tonight's virtual program is another in our ongoing series of literary, cultural, and civic programming, and in celebration of National Poetry Month. Today's event additionally is part of our Voices for Justice series, which seeks to highlight author, thought leaders, and in this case, poets, who can spark conversations in the areas of social justice. During tonight's program, we'll be monitoring an online chat for questions from the audience for a brief Q&A following the conversation. So please feel free to ask questions in the chat. Tonight is my pleasure to welcome poet Noor Hindi. Dear God, dear bones, dear yellow, interrogates, subverts, and expands questions through poems that are formally and lyrically complex, dynamic, and innovative. With rich intertextuality and an unwavering eye, Noor Hindi explores and interrogates colonialism, religion, patriarchy, and the complex intersections of her identity. Noor Hindi is a Palestinian American poet and reporter and is the equity and inclusion reporter for Devil Strip Magazine. She is a 2021 Ruth Lilly and Dorothy Sargent Rosenberg Poetry Fellow. Dear God, Dear Bones, Dear Yellow is her debut collection of poems. I want to thank her for joining us this evening. And without further ado, let us all welcome Noor Hindi. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Mariela. Um, it's so, so good to be here and um, to be reading and be in uh, space with, with everybody. And thank you for that wonderful introduction and for interacting with the book. I really appreciate it. Um, I uh, am going to read a little bit from the book and then I think I'm gonna read some newer poems if that's okay with everyone. Um, and then we can wrap up for a Q and A again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for Chicago public library for hosting. And I'm just really excited to be, um, in community with y'all today. So the also just like, I'm just happy that the book will be in libraries. Um, I am a big, I started out actually, uh, reading poetry collections when I worked at the library system in Ohio and the way that I was finding all of the books that I wanted to find was through the library system and interlibrary loans and Ohio link and uh, I was constantly working the desk and on quiet nights I would just have this like stack of poetry collections that I would that I'd read through and I had this blog where I was reviewing um, not really reviewing, more of just very loudly praising books I loved um, and writing about them. And that was like the best, like two years of reading of my life. And um, so yeah, thanks. Thanks and shout out to our awesome library systems for the work that they do. So I'm gonna start um, with reading from the first section of the book. Uh, the very first poem of the book is titled Self-Interrogation, and it was really important for me to, uh, there's a lot of conversation in the book that talks about the imprints of colonialism, that talks about um, Israeli violence, that talks about um, uh, misogyny, and it was really, really important for me to begin the book um, first interrogating myself and the speaker of the book. And so this is self-interrogation. At the airport terminal, a woman is crying. Excuse me, excuse me, excuse me. I need to focus on something besides the rush of migration, lights so loud, the unending sound of a newscaster's voice. Dear God, dear bones, dear mother, please forgive me. I want to call in dead. Last week, there was a child in a yellow dress reading a poem. For minutes on end, I could not be indifferent to anything. Not the grass dying yellow, not the bombs, twisting limbs, not the cages, not the... Yes, there is a woman crying at Terminal 6. Yes, I use a newspaper to cover my eyes. Yes, I think of the child, 
the tiny silver heart she placed in my palm, how I threw it in the trash seconds later. But I promise, I promise, I promise I meant it as an act of survival, maybe love. Something this poem um, in the book, I think I was really wrestling with is I was writing a lot of these poems post Trump presidency and um, really at the height of so much political turmoil in this country. And then, of course, I started um, or had been for years uh, working as a reporter. And it was really difficult sort of for years to channel everything that was happening in poems, in the papers. It never, nothing, nothing really felt like enough often. Um, and I, and I think there's that instinct in this poem to like, like hide or use that newspaper to cover your eyes and not constantly be on the receiving end of the headlines, um, both as somebody who's reading them and then somebody who's writing some of those headlines and figuring out, um, what does this all mean? What do I do? And how does one, um, survive in this world while helping? and not doing all of the things, but also focusing on just some things that you can do. Um, I'll read some poems. Um, there's, a, there's a series of poems titled Breaking News in the, in the book that I'll, that I'll read and uh, talk a little bit about too. Um, breaking News. Reporting is an act of violence, poetry one of warmth. I own so many televisions, notebooks, pens. There's a woman standing inside of a bus where an act of violence occurs. I record, I interview, I document, I see violence between the bright blue lines of my margins. I tell myself it's enough. Dear victims of capitalism, of oppression, of police brutality, of racism, of misogyny, of America, of colonialism, you are more than the shadow I write through to you. There are sunflowers sprouting from your hands. In five minutes or less, please look into this camera and answer to the following. Start sobbing. When I wake up, I am the flashing red stage lights shooting over my victims. Continue sobbing. Breaking news. We know death is futile. No death as 3.5 thousand retweets, a trauma, a thing named empty, an internet measured in the slow bend of your fingers, clicking the quiet tempo of expiration. Your spleen in the shape of a pen, in the shape of a gun. I am going door to door, collecting story. I place a tape recorder at the edge of a child's stroller and watch her position it between her teeth, chew on story and argue she's agent of her own story. I dream of America as nightmare. As child, placing drone in mouth, as mother, placing drone in child's mouth to condition her tongue to the taste of America, I see you door to door in eviction court, I attend, and a judge asks to see my face, so I show her my blood at the edge of survival, an audience of witness, of whiteness, sir, why are you being evicted, which system? what history I know your trauma is a thing we'll name breaking news your trauma a hunger we crave your trauma behind a paywall your trauma we measure with clicks I document futility to feed America more story muddled by story there is a child crying in front of a pink wall as her home is demolished in Palestine it moves one to tears to watch your own reflection on a screen. Your face in anguish at another's pain looks so sweet, almost heroic. 
So right now I'm actually, I'm not reporting. I've, I've taken a little bit of a break and I'm working in, uh, this is like the, the worst thing to say as an ex reporter, like I'm working in marketing and communications. Um, but I, I really, I burnt out. Um, I reported on housing for a year, uh, specifically uh, evictions that were happening during the pandemic. And I actually officially started the full-time reporting job, um, I think a couple of days following protests of George Floyd's murder. And it was really um, sort of jumping from that. And then the eviction moratorium was happening, but the court systems in Akron were continuing with evictions. And I was in the system just I spent like nine months sitting in courtrooms and watching the system sort of systemically evict people and remove them from their homes during um, just a pandemic and, and the epicenter of an economic disaster for so many people. And uh, it really sort of depressed me actually. And I, I lost, um, I lost the ability, I think, and I'm, I'm sort of refinding it now of seeing the purpose of writing and the purpose of telling a story and the purpose of, of conveying information to people. And that's sort of what the breaking news poems in the book are questioning. Um, and I stopped writing poems at that time too. And some of the only poems I could write were actually the breaking news poems. And I think, cause it was so closely related to the job. Um, but yeah, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna read some more uh, poems. I promise the the book isn't all sad and <laughs> there are some, there are some funny parts. Um, I think I will read, um, I will read the poem, Broken Light Bulb Flickering Away. Every week I fall in love with a new bad idea. I hope one day to magic my body away. I wish for everyone to leave me alone and talk to me at once. Please forgive me. All I've ever wanted is to be the poet laureate of flaming hot Cheetos. All my desires go unnoticed. On my birthday, I visit a fortune teller. She tells me, beware of the J, jackhammers, joylessness, jukeboxes, white men named Jason, Jesus. There is so much junk in my brain. My father escaped war, and here I am, the perfect immigrant child. I assimilate so much. I drink Diet Coke at the rate of a middle-aged white woman. My mother wanted to be a writer. I should hold her sacrifices, but instead sob into a donut decorated like the U.S. flag at 3 a.m. My cat is tired of my antics. My parents named me light because their lives lie in shadow, but I'm a poor example of joy. Sometimes I get so sad I think about eating a quesadilla or assembling a tire swing or taking off my bra. Instead, I dream of the big dumb heart my mother hands me. She tells me to carry it. I drop it every time. That poem is shout out to Chester Cheeto, who will not and would not and has refused to blurb my book um, every every month. Not every month. That's a lie. Like maybe twice a year since I wrote this book, I will tweet at Chester Cheeto begging Chester Cheeto to blurb my book and he will not do it. Um, so also shout out to to my mom and my cat who might make an appearance at some point. I'll read some more poems and my mom, I'll actually tell you guys about the, the cover of the book. Um, I love the, I love the cover. I don't have, I wish I was like a responsible poet who remembered things and like had her own book with her. Uh, but the, uh, the way that the cover came about is I have this poem in the book titled, um, I call my mother from the moon and in the poem, my mother is begging me to come down from the moon so that she, that, so that I could get married. 
And I'm like, no, I don't want to go down. I'm like pretty happy up here. Um, and so shout out to all the Arab moms who are like always after us to get married. Um, and then I found this awesome artist, Adwa, who um, had this like beautiful uh, art piece on her Instagram of this woman in a dress, like in space in front of a telephone booth. And I was like, that's the cover of my book. And so I contacted her and she agreed. And it was a total dream to be able to have her artwork um, in the book. I call my mother from the moon. I say, guess what? I made it to the moon and it's stunning and I miss you and you'd love the view from up here. Men don't exist. I can tell the way she pauses, she's worried. She asks, but how will you bear children in a place with no gravity? How am I to find you a good man from up there? Get down here. I need to teach you how to make a good cake. Your future son will be beautiful like you. Please come down. I miss you. I taught you to be quieter than this. Less hungry for the world so you could fit inside a world unfit for women like us. There is air until there isn't. I've always wanted more than the world she gave me. Up here, my eyes grow larger. I bake a cake. It floats away. I wish she was she was here to catch it. Um, I will read another I will read another poem about my mom and marriage and the pressure to get married and misogyny for y'all. Um, a little bit, I have to do some explaining for this poem. So I grew up in um I grew up in Ohio, which is mostly like Walmarts and cornfields and abandoned malls. And there was this mall that we would go to when I was a kid. And there was this giant sort of demonic looking fake snowman named Archie. And he would like, there was a man actually that they would station inside of Archie who would uh, tell you you would tell him what you wanted for Christmas. And like, he would, he would be like, okay, like that would tell Santa or whatever. Um, and this was all really funny. Cause like I was, I was Muslim. I am Muslim and we didn't celebrate Christmas. And I knew like Santa was a fake, um, but I still loved Archie and I still love Christmas. And so uh, that's who Archie is. So I felt like I needed to, to explain explain this giant talking snowman because he's part of this poem in a dream i get married in an abandoned mall we don't order cake i see a dragon graffitied on a wall in the distance archie the snowman melts and a guy named fred places caution signs everywhere we don't speak about the bullet holes or the broken carousel spinning around and around my fiance is the type of Arab man who thinks smoking double apple hookah is a personality trait. Probably can't find the clitoris and went to school to become a surgeon, but later settled on dentistry. At one point, I look at him and whisper, I don't remember agreeing to this shit. He tells me not to worry. Reminds me he's a doctor, knows a lot about cavities. There are birthday balloons scattered everywhere and I spot a blimp through a small window. My wedding dress is short, so my mother reminds me to close my legs, but I remember I'm on my period, so I'm jamming a $5 bill through a vending machine to purchase tampons and Snickers. When the machine dies, I punch my fiance in the face and we're both shocked at how cathartic it all feels. Shortly after, I hijack the blimp. My teeth become a white picket fence. I wake up as a tattered coat hanging in the closet of my parents' first home. I should uh, explain like what a blimp is. Um, it's a uh, 
floating. I mean, I guess I should. Okay, you, you guys know what a blimp is, but I should explain the like significance of it in Akron, Ohio, where I grew up. Um, of course, Akron was the rubber capital of the world, and uh, Goodyear was like whatever top industry of that and so every now and then in Akron you see the Goodyear blimp just like floating in the sky and it's so cool and it's like it's like Akron city law that you stop everything that you're doing and you take a photo of the blimp um and it continues to be my dream that they let me on the on the blimp um and that Chester Cheeto will blurb my book neither of those have happened but if if there is a god um there are some poetry gods, please, please make it happen. Um, for the for the sake of for the sake of me and only me. Um, so I think I'm gonna I'm gonna read um, some newer poems if that's okay. I I think uh, so I, I'm, I'm writing. I was I the first book I think is like, I think very politically heavy. Um, and I think very like laced with a lot of reporting trauma I'd sort of accumulated over the years. And um, so much of the center of the book is about displacement and home and my growing up with my father who is uh, a Palestinian refugee. Um, I've been writing these poems lately about uh, the 52 Hertz whale and if you don't know who this whale is, it's, there's a cool documentary about it on Hulu. And I'll give you like a little bit of a like spark notes version of this whale. So this whale is, he like speaks, like the noise he makes is at 52 Hertz, which is a higher frequency than other whales. They can't find, they haven't been able to find him. They've never found this whale. They can only hear him. And they have described him, scientists have described him as the loneliest whale in the world because there are none other like him. It's really sad. It's, it's, it's definitely, it's definitely very sad. So I've been writing these poems about this, like, you know, freaking whale and, um, loneliness and, uh, we'll see, we'll see where we go from there on time. And I'm so excited to, uh, to take some questions from y'all for, yeah, from y'all, sorry. The world's loneliest whale sings the loudest song and other confessions. I won't make metaphors out of fish. If I have to die, I choose the ocean. If I have to live, I choose you, you, everyone I've ever mourned. I believe less and less of sunlight these days. I won't die alone. To awaken crying is to awaken displaced. Ghost of your joy in the bathtub, a face in the mirror, your nephew's painting in the foyer. My mother cried in bedrooms growing up. I would study her for hours. In a study, Researchers learned patients who cried less are likely to have dismissive attachment styles. Today, every bedroom in the house is mine. I stopped crying at age 12. I am angry at the color yellow. Trauma and all eight of its tentacles make a mangle of my skin. I can't find my home as a child. I hated being the youngest. I hated being looked at by those I loved. In dreams, I spoke a language no one understood. Research suggests loneliness increases cardiovascular disease. When my cousin died, she died alone. Heart failure makes the body go boom. When the world collapsed around Darwish, he wrote of coffee and sex. When you held my body close to yours, I thought of clementines, sweet citrus, all the world's lemons we temper with honey. The world's loneliest whale sings the loudest song. This is what you'll tell me the first time we meet. And I'll think about the ocean and I'll think about you. I never learned how to swim. I've been drowning my whole life. Studies suggest drowning lasts one to three minutes. I'll never stop grieving. Scientists are still searching for the 52 Hertz whale, but I swear he's here in my bedroom and I can hear him 
and he's telling me I can stop. So that is the first poem and I will read, I will read two more. And then I trust that Chicago Public Library will tell me to shut up when, I, I, when I'm out of time. Um, the world's loneliest whale sings the loudest song and other confessions. The sound of laughter still unsettles me. Fact, other whales can hear 52, but they cannot understand him. No one heard me crying growing up. My mother never shed a single tear of joy, fact. The first time I heard my father cry, the house collapsed with the weight of our living. I said goodbye for an entire year. I painted my front door yellow. I stopped thinking about bees, Neapolitan ice cream, the peacock in our backyard only I could see. Fact, sometimes the people we love become animal. I did not approach. There was a road I memorized. I treated the television as a door. Sometimes I was visited by the dead. A bottle of Old Spice spilled on the carpet. Fact, no one has ever seen 52. When my father yelled, I took the peacock by the throat. My mother told me a story once of a spider saving our prophet. Fact, when 52 calls out, he is calling for his mother. I have missed every flight I've ever booked. My body is still learning to stop waiting for ugly sounds. My body is still learning to stop pulling the fire alarm. My roommates build a spider web around our house. I tell 52 he can stop searching. The ocean extends its arms. I fall asleep to the sweet quiet of someone's voice. And the last poem I will read is dedicated to York peppermint patties. The world's loneliest whale sings the loudest song and other confessions. I should mention, yeah, the, the, all these poems are titled the same because I, I got like tired of titling things, part of that. And also it was just like, I kind of like the title. Have you ever cried in grocery store, in a grocery store aisle next to some stupid fruit months after leaving home? Have you tried turning off the computer then turning it back on? Have you searched for your father in aisle six, where a pair of pants dressed like a man calculates the price of groceries this week? Have you invested in stocks? Did you lose money during the 2008 market collapse? Did your father ever tell you he loves you? Did he ever buy you a single York peppermint patty because it cost 98 cents? Did a good day mean all the stock market tickers turned green? Did your father try his best? Did he split the patty in two? Did it mean he loves you? Did it become ritual? Did you see him as smart, capable? loving rather than a man wearing a tie calculating his way out of poverty do you refuse to look at numbers now do you still feel guilty the shelf of york peppermint patties in your car sweet shame on your tongue did your father ever tell you he loves you thank you Thank you so much. I mean, there's just so much millennial, <laughs> like so many, so millennial and so many of these pieces that are just like, oh yeah, that, that, that actually resonates <laughs> with such a large audience. Um, so thank you so much for reading and for giving us a little preview of your future works. Um, I do have a few questions and they were sent to us ahead of time by our patrons too. So, oh, cool. access, so okay. So, um, so first question is, uh, when do you remember writing your first poem? Did a teacher spark the idea? How did you get into poetry? So I sort of, um, I don't know if anyone remembers, but it's still really popular, but there was like a point, I feel like when it was like maybe 2011, 2012 and you know, Facebook was still sort of like emerging and 
phones were becoming a thing and and all of these uh spoken word artists were starting to like upload their videos on youtube and that was sort of my emergence as i i fell in love with um with slam and with uh performance poetry which is i mean which is regular poetry i don't want to like make that distinction um but the first time i'd really been exposed to poetry in a way that i loved was seeing it performed and i would just go through these youtube videos um for hours and uh that's what really ignited my love of it and i had this amazing 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 english teacher in high school um who just we did this creative right we had this creative writing class it was an elective and we would make art in this class and we'd read books and we'd watch these videos together and she'd let us um share our work with the class and 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 go up and and you know read our poems and it just became like a thing at our school um and we weren't popular for it like it was <laughs> It was like five of us, um, but like we were known as the poets and we felt really cool. And um, yeah, it was, that was, uh, that was one of the best like times maybe in high school and like in high school and like now I look back at it with such nostalgia and like love and endearingness. They had like a seventh grade poet collective of like... <laughs> Yeah, I mean, yeah, it was like, it was like a 10th grade and 11th grade poet collective. And it was really <laughs> such a home for me because I, I grew up in a very like turbulent home. And, um, you know, in case you didn't notice, <laughs> <from my poems. laughs> and uh, the year that uh, I was at, I was in a lot of grief in my sophomore and junior year of high school, because my cousin who was my closest like friend growing up um died from myocarditis in her sleep and so it was really sudden no one expected it and um I couldn't I didn't understand like what it meant what death meant and uh that class was like such a safe haven for for so many years um after and in helping me just process like my grief and what had happened wow. so poetry as a type of therapy for dealing with oh totally yeah okay. um so on that what what would you like people to take away from your work from dear god dear bones dear yellow yeah i think um one of the coolest things i hear from people when they reach out to me is when a poem really resonates with them. Um, I just, I think that connection is so powerful and magical. And I, you know, for so many years reading and, and poetry and books and authors were my safe haven and a place where um, it was a source of comfort. It was a source of being seen um when I grew up where I didn't feel very seen both like politically and like even within my my family and which happens when you have like a really big family right um and I just found so much um peace in reading and the coolest thing right now about like publishing this book is when people are like, Hey, I read this poem and it was, it resonated with me. And so I don't think I want people to take something away as much as like, I just hope that the book is helpful to them in some way and that they see themselves in the, in the poems. And maybe it helps them put words to a really like complicated and sometimes often like crappy world that we live in um where it's really hard to find joy and and hope um so much of the time okay uh the color yellow is used a lot in your work so can you talk about that significance yeah sure so uh my cousin's favorite color was yellow 
and her favorite flower was sunflower. So they come up in the work a lot. And over the years, it's really become a source, like that color uh, in that flower has really become a source of joy and hope um, for me and a, and a sense of like healing. And so when I moved uh, to Dearborn, Michigan, I like legitimately painted my front door yellow. Like that was one of the first things I did um, after, after getting the house. And uh, yeah. And so I, I just kept, I didn't even notice it. I was writing the book in my, during my MFA and my advisor started reading these poems. She's like, what is going on with the color yellow? I was like, what are you talking about? I don't know. <laughs> and she's like, no, no, no. Like it comes up this many times, like do like, you know, command F in your Google docs and, and, and find the number of times. And so it, and then I just, I really leaned into it. Um, cause I don't, it's not a color that you see often, like you see a lot of blue and works, um, or a lot of green, but I think, I think yellow is a underrepresented color. <laughs> Okay. Um, so, you know, a lot of uh, your work has sort of inspiration from like, like the, the news brief, breaking news, whatnot. So, you know, with disinformation and when, what's going on and serving as a reporter, do you find like, how does how's news media sort of serve a role in, in your poems? Yeah, so it's, um, I get asked this question a lot and I've been trying to reflect on it. I think that growing up immigrant, growing up with a father who's a refugee, growing up with a family that is Palestinian, um, my first act of reporting was like pressing record on my phone and just interviewing them about their stories and hearing their stories because in a lot of ways, our stories are not told in the media um, or in books and they're not talked about. Like to say, to say Palestine is like, you're saying a bad word at this point in our country and it's always been this way. And so um, I think that I became a poet to, as an act of defiance to tell my story and my family's story and my father's story and I became a reporter because I wanted to change how we write these stories. Um, and I wanted to approach storytelling with more empathy and compassion towards subjects. And um, I think that now that I've left reporting my desire to go back to it has been really great I, I like admit um I lost the question in my in my <laughs> just how you know how news media serves as a role in your poetry like just you know. yeah um so naturally I grew I grew up in the U.S. um post 9-11, right? And I feel like constantly in my house, my dad was always playing the news. Um, whatever was happening, like largely politically in the Middle East in relation to the US um, was like playing out in my high school. And that was really difficult because I was going to an all white high school. And then it was at a time where Arabs and Muslims were demonized and I mean they still are like I act like this stuff is from the past but and so yeah just an act of defiance to tell our own stories and also um it naturally comes up in the work because I often find myself arguing with a lot of reporting and I often found myself when I was reporting arguing with my own reporting and how I was looking at subjects and how I was um working with and maneuvering through the system that was very not very much not built for compassion right like you go to the scene of something and it's so sudden and you're instead of like you're just supposed to document like you can't help people you're not allowed to 
um, you, maybe sometimes you don't even have time to like ask them how their day is, how are they to get them the help that they need. Everything is so like quick. It's this machine that it's just churning out material. Um, and it drove me crazy. And so, uh, that's where it comes in in the work. And then also just growing up post line 11, like it was really difficult to see oneself in a positive light without stories about oneself other than the ones that were written by white journalists and reporters. You say um, discussion, discussing on a document that you're able to document, but in yeah. your poetry, you're able to put yourself into it mm -hmm. instead of yeah, so serves sort of as a device, a different way of speaking, but being able to be like truly. Oh, completely. Yeah. I mean, if you're if you're a person of color in this country, if you're immigrant, if you're an immig if you're a refugee, if you any sort of like community that is marginalized, like you cannot rely on you cannot rely on these large media centers to tell your story. Um, and you have to just pick up the pen and do it yourself. Um, and I think that can be such a powerful thing. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so a, few, a couple more questions. Um, so this is probably a much bigger one. Um, were you writing this book throughout the pandemic and that did the pandemic affect your writing and did it come across or how, how, how did the pandemic affect your writing? <laughs> They're great questions. So <laughs> it's funny because I did not get much writing done during the pandemic. Like I graduated from my MFA May 2020 so in the midst of the pandemic I did my thesis defense in sweatpants <laughs> literally and um I didn't have a graduation uh because of course like things were shut down and you know a couple there was some like really awful stuff happening with the Akron Art Museum at that time. So I jumped into that investigative piece and then George Floyd got murdered and we were covering the protests throughout the summer. And then I got the fellowship to reveal and started reporting on housing and was um, in eviction court and uh, being in eviction court for that long. And it took me a while to like understand this is being a displaced person, watching people get displaced by the system, like really messed me up. And so I did not get a lot of writing done that year. I did a lot of reading. I read a lot of great books. Um, I wrote some of the breaking news poems, um, probably June, July, August of 2020. And then I just went silent. Um, and it wasn't until I went to a residency in Massachusetts the following March of 2021 and I it was two weeks and I remember spending I spent three days just sleeping and resting and then I I was staying at um Mass Mocha the the really large museum there and uh I think it's not Amherst but I can't remember where but I was looking at a lot of art pieces and then I started writing again um, and finally got some words out. But those were, I ended up starting like a more nonfiction lyric book. And I like cranked out a few, I cranked out pages of that and then stopped writing again and like picked it up again this, these last like three months. So um, it has been hard to, it's been hard to create. <laughs> Right. There was that expectation that, you know, um, you were supposed to write your long unwritten novel and do all these accomplishments oh as if we aren't, you know, surviving a very traumatic In a literal crisis. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Um, so um, are there any poets that you can recommend for our audience to seek out after reading your collection? Any oh favorites? So <laughs> many poets. Um, Terrence Hayes, love Terrence Hayes. Um, Ross Gay uh, writes so much about gratitude and joy. 
but it's a type of gratitude and joy that's rooted in survival and um it's not like the reason I, I put that in there is because I, it's you see a lot of work that's like oh like if you just smile everything will be okay it's not that like it's you know um I really really love his work and I would definitely recommend Claudia Rankin who is I suppose between the the genres of nonfiction and 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 poetry um Citizen is a great book and made a lot of waves, I think in 2016, but also uh, Don't Let Me Be Lonely is arguably my favorite book, um, even more than Citizen. And it's a little bit less, uh, I think it's talked about less. Who else would I recommend? Um, I'm thinking about Fatima Asghar. Yeah, I could, I could list like 30 people, but I'll, I'll stop there. <laughs> you could probably check out all those books at your local yes. library <laughs> out at the library and like you know that's I think I think it goes a long way of both supporting the poet and the library system when you yes. check out the book rather than buying it okay so we're close to the end I was wondering if you want to close with one final poem yeah sure um I will read this poem called good night moon good night red balloon good night moon good night red balloon i write you a letter in the parking lot of a grocery store at a party a white boy offers me a job as a 911 dispatcher someone is running their hands through my hair and i like it my mother slept for the entirety of my life. Everyone beautiful in slumber. Sweet sunset, stereo, shame. I am not afraid anymore. I am subscribing to the Detroit free press after good sex and a tongue that tastes like winter. My father, the quiet chirp of a dying smoke alarm. I am a good operator. Is anyone injured? Does it look like a gun? Sometimes the music is so loud, my heart aches like a coffin. I am begging you to stay alive. I am hoping the dead love us years beyond their withered bodies. Bright bones, bright balloon, what's your emergency? My stupid face in the mirror, daisies sprouting from my lips, my friends telling me they love me. Thank you. Thank you. It was wonderful to close the evening. So that is all the time we have this evening. The book again is Dear God, Dear Bones, Dear Yellow by Nora Hindi, which you can order from Haymarket Books, which comes out next month in May, or you can check it out at the local Chicago Public Library or any library that you might be near. But we also encourage you to visit any of Chicago's independent bookstores to purchase a copy. Tonight's program will be available on Chicago Public Library's YouTube page. If you have any friends who weren't able to join us tonight, please invite them to watch it on demand. And please visit the Chicago Public Library website for many more upcoming virtual events at shypublib.org. Thank you, Noor Hindi, and thanks to everyone for tuning in. Have a great night, everyone, and stay well. <laughs>